I think it's already pretty clear how logic and logical forms and statements and operations are going to be used in computer science in the constructions of the programs, but they're actually embedded in the very hardware of the computers itself, because this logic rules and logic gates is what we're going to talk about in terms of electrical circuits. So a simple switch has two positions. This is a switch, it can be open or it can be closed. Notice that if it's open, then if I have a current running through, it won't be able to make it from the left side of the wire to the right side of the wire. It will run, op run open and then not be able to proceed, which means that there's gonna be no current going through here, which means that we denote this position with zero. In the case when the gate or switch is closed, it means that the current can make it all the way through and there is actually current in the wire on the right hand side and we denote that by one. The absence of a current is denoted by zero, the presence of it is denoted by one. A switch is usually part of a bigger circuit because we need to actually get power from somewhere and we need to get power to somewhere where we care about. So in this case, we're gonna have a battery and the light. And that is a pretty standard notation for that. So let me now note that down here. So think about this switch as quite literally the switch that you turn on or off in your house when you want the light to come on or off. Depending on the position of the switch, the battery will send the current either all the way to the light or it won't be able to actually proceed. In the picture here, it's open, so my current is not going to make it to the light, and the light is not going to be turned on. In terms of composing two switches together or connecting them, there are two different ways in which they can actually be constructed, again, in the hardware. We can have two switches, P and Q, be connected in series, so in a row, P followed by Q, or we can have these two switches be connected in parallel. So notice how this wire splits into two parallel wires with one switch on each one. And depending on whether the switches are in series or in parallel, they will actually affect the current flow from the battery to the light in different ways. Okay, so let's take a look at these two different scenarios one at a time. So in both cases, I do have two switches, right? So I have a switch P and a switch Q. Here they're denoted with capital letters, so we're gonna keep them as that. And what I can think about is, depending on the actual position of the switch in terms of being open or closed, what is the state of the bulb? Is it turned on or is it turned off? Okay, so I'm going to have the exact same situation for both of these cases. So let me just paste the same table under the series and under the parallel set. Okay, so let's think about how we're actually going to go through these tables now. For my switches, P and Q, again, they can be either open, which means there's no current, or they're going to be closed, which means that there's a current. So, depending on how you fill in your tables, this is going to be reminiscent of the table of the truth tables that we've been constructing so far. So I have one, one, zero, zero, as in true, true, false, false, and then true, false, true, false. Okay. Now it's important to remember here though that zero means open, no current, one means closed, and therefore current. So if the switch is closed and closed, what do we have? Imagine now this switch being quite physically closed and closed. This is when the current is going to make it all the way through to the bulb and the bulb will actually be turned on. But what happens if I have a closed switch followed by an open switch? So the switch for P is closed, so the current made it through here, but this switch is still open, which means that nothing can make it down to the bulb, so the bulb will be not turned on. And it's going to be the same situation in the other two cases. As long as one of these switches is open, the current is not going to make it through, which means that the bulb will not turn on. So what we notice is that the only way the bulb actually 
is turned on is if both of the switches are closed and that's when we have light. Think for a second about what logical logic operation that we've seen so far this truth table reminds you of where the only time we have a truth value is if we have true and true and it shouldn't be a big surprise that this in fact is the and operation our conjunction now what do we have when we have parallel switches if we have anything of pattern at all Okay, so we're going to go through the same logic here. I'm going to fill in my table with all the possible switch positions. And then think about what happens in terms of the current. So if both of the switches are closed, closed here, closed here, the current will run through both sides. It will actually exit through both sides and will certainly make it to the lamp. So the lamp will be turned on. What will happen if P is closed, so the current will make it through, but Q is open, so it remains like that. Well, current actually will go down both wires and it won't make it through Q, but it will make it through P. So it will exit through here and get to the bulb. So we're still going to have light. And in the next case, it's actually going to be the opposite, right? So P is going to remain open, Q is going to stay closed, which means that the current going through won't make it through the P wire, but we'll make it through the Q wire down to the lamp, and so we will have light in this case as well. If both of the switches remain open, then the current can't go past them, and therefore can't make it to the lamp, so this is the one case where we're going to have no light and the zero value for the bulb state. Again, thinking of what this truth table reminds you of, you notice that the only time it's false is when both of the switches are um, open, and this is very much, not just reminiscent, but identical to the OR, or the disjunction truth table from before. And this essentially is the direct connection between studying logic and studying the basic electrical circuits. Now, generally, of course, um, we don't just have circuits with two switches and nothing else. We have quite a few different inputs and quite a few different operations that can happen in between. We're going to think of that as input signals, let's say PQR here, then some kind of circuit um, embedded inside and an output signal on the other side, okay? In terms of constructing more complicated networks of these circuits, we actually will consider several what are called gates, basic gates that are embedded in um, microchips and on hardware. And they will, again, be analogous to the logical um, forms that we've already seen, the not, the and, and the or. And they will behave exactly the same way. So on the exit here, we have not P. On the exit here, we have P and Q. And on the exit here, we have P or Q. And if we were to construct the truth table for these um, basic gates, the truth table will be exactly the same as it was for their logic counterparts. So what we have is not P, P and Q, and then P or Q. And again, in constructing the truth tables, remember that you want to, first of all, list all the possibilities. And in terms of electric circuits, we usually keep it with the zeros and ones versus truths and falses, because here it's much more reasonable to think about um, the current and not the true or false value of it. But the way that operations work will be exactly the same. So not P will mean that I take the column for P and I negate everything. So I flip all of the positions. P and Q gate will be P and Q the way that we think about it logically. So 1 and 1 is 1, 1 and 0 is 0, 0 and 1 is 0, 0 and 0 is 0. The only time the and is true is if both of the P and Q are also true. And for the disjunction for the OR, we're going to think about OR, applying the operation of OR to P and Q. So we're going to have 1, 1, 1. The only time that we have 
a false is if both of the zeros. In terms of constructing more complicated uh, combinatorial circuits out of these basic gates, we will have to follow several rules. We can never combine two input wires. That means that I can't have like some sort of junction uh, between two input wires that is not a logic gate. If the wires are to be combined, they have to be combined somehow in a logic gate fashion. A single input wire can be split and used as input into two separate gates. So that means that kind of like in the series um, example above, I can split the wire into two separate ones and then it can go into two separate um, gates. An output wire can be used as an input, so I can have, you know, a um, sequence of gates with the same wire. No output of a gate can eventually feed back into that same gate. So if something came out of it, it can't also be an input. It cannot be some kind of infinite loop of going in and out, okay? Pretty straightforward, uh, not, nothing too outrageous here in terms of um, rules for combinatorial circuits. So let's see how we can combine them together, these gates, and what would that mean for our input and output values. So here's our first combinatorial circuit example, and I'm given specific input values. So P is 1, Q is 0, and R is 1. We're asked to find the output in this circuit. Because the values are given, and I'm not asked to list all of them, I can simply actually label them right on my circuit, 1, 0, 1, and then see what happens as these values go through the indicated gates. So what do I have here? P and Q, 1 and 0, went into the OR gate. So 1 OR 0 on the output, I'm going to have to have the, um, the result of this operation. 1 OR 0 is a 1. So on the output here, I have a 1. And then that goes into my next gate, which is a NOT, which is the gate that negates everything. So on the output here, I will have the opposite of the input. So the opposite of 1. This R notice just went all the way in, so in the input here, I still have 1, that was the R, and now I have the gate AND that takes in two inputs, 0 and 1. 0 and 1 will have output of 0, so in my case here, the output of P being 1, Q being 0, and R being 1 will be S equals 0. Okay. Again, this was fairly straightforward because I was given three particular values for those input wires, so I was able to trace it all through. The more comprehensive case is when I'm just given the circuit and I'm asked to construct input-output table for the whole thing. That means that I have to consider all possible input values and produce all possible output values. Okay. So let's, for example, call output R here, and we will have to construct all the possibilities for the input, um, for the inputs. So I have P and I have Q. And once again, I know that if I have P and Q, I will have four different ways to put them together. And then what is my R value going to be? So I'll have to trace all of these possibilities through the circuit and then see the resulting numbers. Okay, so first case, I have one and one. I'm essentially doing the exact same exercise, but for all possibilities for the input. So one and one. What's going to happen is this goes in as is, right? Whereas one goes through the not gate, which means on the exit here, it's going to be a zero. And now my and gate takes in zero and one. Zero and one is zero, so my output here is going to be zero. And then you do the same for the rest of the table, okay? So I'm going to have in the next case one and zero, so I'm going to feed in the zero. Notice that I sort of saved myself some work a little bit by not redoing the first half. Zero and zero is still zero, okay? And then I'm going to have to change everything around, so my next input is zero, one. 0, 1. Again, nothing happens to Q until the AND gate. 
but the P, the zero goes through the NOT gate. So on the exit, it's going to be the opposite of the input. So a one, and then one and one go into the AND gate. One and one is going to be one. Okay, and then finally, the last one is going to be zero, zero. So again, I haven't redone this work because I didn't have to. The value stayed the same. So all I have to consider is the inputs to the AND gate, one and zero, which will produce the output of zero. And there we go. The input output table is the table that lists all the possible inputs into the um, circuit and then lists all the corresponding possible outputs, okay? Now, if we were going to deal with bigger, more complicated circuits, then of course, constructing input output table for it might get really uh, laborsome, right? Because I didn't actually consider the structure of the circuit. I had to take it one line at a time and put these inputs one at a time and then reconstruct the output every single time. But it feels like I should be able to somehow leverage what I already know of these logic operations to make my job a little bit easier. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to introduce a notion of a Boolean variable and that's a variable that can take on only one of two values. So in our case, it will be one and zero, okay? An expression composed of Boolean variables can take all of the connectives that we've seen so far as gates, so not, or, and and, and it's going to be called a Boolean expression. Boolean expressions will come in very handy in the construction and analysis of combinatorial circuits. So what we have here now is the same exact circuit as we had before, but instead of constructing the truth table for it, we're asked to construct the Boolean expression for it. So how can I describe the output in terms of the inputs and the gates that it went through? So what we're gonna do is exactly what we've done before by following through the wires, but now instead of assigning specific values to P and Q, we're actually gonna follow the operations that happened 2p and q along the way, okay? So p went into the not gate, which means on the output it was not p, and q went all the way to the end gate as itself, so it arrived there as q, and then the last operation, we took the two inputs and produced an output. So I had not p and q. So on the output here, I have not p and q. And this Boolean expression describes the output of this Boolean, of this uh, combinatorial circuit, okay? Now, this is a slightly more complicated circuit. Um, there's three input variables uh, and there's three different gates. So let's just be careful about um, how we consider it. So first of all, this P and Q go into the OR gate, which means that on the exit, I'm going to have P or Q. That will then go through the NOT gate, and you got to be careful with the brackets here. It's going to be the negation of everything that went in. So the negation of the input, the negation of that. This is then going to feed into the AND gate together with R that came there directly, and that's going to produce our output. Right. So the last operation here is the AND gate with the inputs of NOT P or Q and R. So what I'm going to have is NOT P or Q. Q and R. And this describes my combinatorial circuit here. The reason that the Boolean expressions are much more convenient than what we've done here before with the input output table is I no longer have to trace each single line through the circuit itself. I can simply replace the output with my new Boolean expression and then do the logic operations on that. Okay, I already know how not and and behave, so I won't have to go one single value at a time. I can construct the entire column immediately. So this will save quite a bit of work. Now let's take a look at what happens if we want to go backwards. So what if I am given a Boolean expression and I want to construct a circuit that corresponds to that expression? This is 
going to require a little bit of um, maybe draft work. So whatever you draw the first time, you might have to re-sketch because the wires won't quite um, necessarily fit nicely immediately because our first sketch isn't necessarily going to be the last one. Okay, But another nice rule of thumb to think about is in this expression, what is the last operation before output that gets applied? And the last operation here is this OR. This is my last operation. So if I work sort of from right to the left, it's going to be a little bit easier to actually construct. I also see that I've only started with two input variables, P and Q. So what I already know is that my P is going to go somewhere, my Q is going to go somewhere, and my last operation is going to have to be an OR. So I can draw myself an OR gate. And on exit is going to be my actual input. Let's call it R. All right, but something happens in the middle that is the rest of this. Okay, so now we have to actually follow through. So what is this OR connecting? This OR is connecting not Q. So that's fairly easy to construct. I will send my Q through, let me give myself a little bit of room just in case, I'm going to send it through the NOT gate and then feed it as the input into the OR gate. So I've covered this portion of my expression, but now I still have this first part to take care of. And whatever outputs from here has to go into the OR gate on the other side. Okay, so first of all, I have NOT P. So my P has to go through the NOT gate as well. And then it has to get ANDed with Q. Now, this is where my Q comes from. So I will have to split this wire. Let me make it in a different color so it's clear. I'm going to have to split this wire. One part is going to go into this gate. And the other part is going to go and attach itself with an AND to the NOT P. So on the exit here, I have NOT P. Both of these guys are now going to, together, go into the AND gate. Whoops. AND gate. And so now, on exit here, I'm going to have not P and Q. And it has to go into my final OR gate to compose the final expression. Okay? As I said, this might not be the prettiest sketch. And if you wanted to make it really neat, just redraw it. Okay? And I'm going to leave this last exercise for you to do as extra, as extra work, but everything that it's asking for is what we've done on this page. So first of all, we start with the two circuits. We're going to construct input-output table for each one. First, do it just like we did with this exercise where you trace each single potential input value all the way through. It's just good for extra practice with the operations and with how the gates work. But for the second part, construct a Boolean expression for each one to compare whether or not you have the same thing that the input out table produced. Okay, just a little bit more practice with both the logic and the design of the actual combinatorial circuits.